Thank you, Marcia. I just wanted to say thank you very much to Carol for her presentation and to Marcia for your presentation as well. We do have a couple of questions. And the first question that was asked earlier when Carol was speaking initially was, people wanted to be isolated, but how do we bring them out if they are having social anxiety? So I'm understanding the question to be, how do we address people who themselves are using crystal meth and choose isolation, how do we connect with them and bring them out of that place of isolation? I think it's important, first of all, to understand what's happening for that individual. So why are they isolated? Do they have, you know, are they, you know, having suicide ideations or are they experiencing anxiety and depression? I think are critical questions to have as a helper so that when we approach them, We know that those are potential issues surrounding crystal meth, and then we can attend to them just by, first of all, going to where they are at and establishing a relationship, a safe relationship that they can reach out to. And I don't think that our first goal in that situation should be pulling them out of some place that they've created that they may have a sense of safety for them, although we may not understand the safety that they've created for themselves. Thank you, Carol. I think that the same individual clarified their question a little bit, and maybe you want to expand on your answer, or Marsha may want to comment as well. The question then became, how do you engage people who are using and not motivated to change, for example, and how do you connect with them and engage them in available supports and services? So, you know, maybe I can start with that first. And I don't know if the person maybe received part of the answer later on in my presentation when I talked a bit about 13 moons. So, first of all, we operate on a principle of meeting people where they are at, which means that if they don't want to engage in the services that we have to offer, then we need to find out what it is they would engage with and see if that's something that we can do or connect with them otherwise. And just recognizing that there are a number of reasons why people may choose not to engage in currently available programs and services. And, you know, one of the things with meth in particular is it can be hard for people to sit still in a defined space for a long time. So some of the other programming isn't really good for that. And so one thing that's kind of simple to do that sometimes helps over bringing peers together or whatever is to have even a box of things that are tactile, that people can fidget with, that they can direct their energy towards ensuring things are scheduled in small chunks of time so that people can get up, move around, ensuring that people are aware that if they're standing up, moving around, et cetera, that's fine. So changing our expectations about whether they're going to be able to sit down and pay attention, and stay with one task for a long time. So it's really being able and willing to adjust what our expectations are and how we're planning and conducting spaces in response to how the substance that they're using may be impacting them and their needs related to that. Sorry, that was the main thing that I wanted to say. Okay, the other thing was to think about who is offering the services. So... Like I have said, in our harm reduction program, we are using an Indigenous youth model, specifically Indigenous youth who have been impacted by substances as well. So it is much easier for the Indigenous youth we are working to serve to relate to them. And so that is the other thing is by really trying to meet people where they're at with services, uh, programs, et cetera, that they express interest in. And then also by people that they are more likely to feel comfortable with and relate to. Thank you, Carol and Marsha. There are a couple of questions here that are about what are medications or medicines that can be used as a way to cope with withdrawal symptoms? There was also another question that asked if there were herbal remedies that could be used for this as well. I've heard different elders and cultural practitioners talk about herbal remedies. I've um, heard treatment centers who have elders and cultural practitioners working with them who use traditional medicines. But one of the principles is 
that no medicine is specific to the situation and the people that are using it. The way you prepare the medicines is also critically important. And so while there is knowledge about the medicines, and I've heard some of them named, they aren't medicines that we should be just naming for people to go and find and to use, maybe not using them within a cultural frame of mind. So I would say then that an answer to that is to talk to the local Indigenous people, communities, elders, and cultural practitioners to find out who has the knowledge of the medicine and what specific medicines can be used. I think it's harmful to just say, well, you know, use wheatgrass, for example, because it grows everywhere. But I would say for sure that a common belief around medicines is the use of medicines for prayer. And so, you know, that's not attending to the withdrawal, but it also attends to the belief and the hope. Prayer has been identified in common cultural practices as very important and meaningful because it establishes a sense of hope. And I think there's a lot of hopelessness and desperation among First Nations communities about what is the answer. So on medicines, you have to talk to the local elders. You have to find out what medicines are being used by those communities. I'll leave the other medical kinds of perspectives of medicines to Marcia. She can <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping to avoid that as well. I mean, the short answer <laughs> on <laughs> the short answer on that is the evidence is way better for opioids and opioid replacement treatment than it is for any type of medication for crystal meth. So secondary conditions like depression, psychosis, anxiety can be treated with medications for depression, psychosis, and anxiety. Uh, There is not yet evidence or guidelines for replacement type therapy for crystal meth. Anecdotally, I know a lot of youth uh, use cannabis to try to help manage their withdrawal symptoms if they're trying to decrease their meth use, and some of them find that helpful. But again, I wouldn't say that is from like a a study or a medical perspective, but it is a fairly common practice. So another question is, in Alberta, within First Nations communities, the majority of people who are showing up at the ER overdosing are women. Is this a reflection of the marginalization of women in First Nations communities? So I think there are two things around that. So one is yes, and there's a lot of targeting that happens for Indigenous women that involves the use of substances. And then the second aspect of that is that women are more likely to present for health care across different conditions, including but not limited to substance use and to access services for same. And this example is from British Columbia, not from Alberta, But I remember uh, a presentation at the Canadian Public Health Association a couple of years ago, and this has been shown in evidence as well, is that uh, the most common demographic for overdose deaths in BC is around, you know, slightly older, so 40-ish, 40 to 50-ish year old males. Uh, And again, that has to do with them being more likely to isolate themselves and not access services compared to women. So one is the very real targeting of women, and then the second is women being more likely to access health services. Another question uh, is, what type of counseling approaches, other than CBT and drumming, which was already mentioned, are effective for crystal meth use? I think it's important to pay attention to when a counseling approach is used. Reflective listening, which is an aspect of motivational interviewing is just the way that you talk and listen to people. And that is effective at any stage in any cycle of uh, the crystal meth use. So, you know, not approaching people with a hundred questions. You can't engage people when you're just asking questions. But if you are approaching people with the intent to listen, to understand, then you're more likely to establish a relationship and get a connection. That isn't necessarily counseling. And so I would say that counseling is further down the road as people direct that they want that. Our first intervention is not counseling around intergenerational trauma. Our first intervention is, like I said, providing for those basic needs, attending to their physical safety. So that is critically important. Now, in that environment, Marsha mentioned uh, smudging and drumming. Those can be tools 
that help to set up the environment and help to keep people engaged, you're attending to their spiritual needs. That is not counseling because you're not talking, you know, about suffering. So if people do engage and they say when you're doing outreach, because I know there are programs where they have people walking the streets, doing outreach, finding people who are in crystal meth, who may be in some sense of danger and inviting them into safe overnight environments. And if people want to talk, about what is affecting their life, then you have to be present and available for that. If people are hallucinating, then you have to be able to talk to them and not make fun of them or discount or deny the hallucinations and the things that they're talking about. So again, it's the reflective listening, hearing to understand, reflecting to people with the intent that you're maintaining a connection and not that you have a whole bunch of answers that you want to apply. There's one quick question, and it is, is there a place where someone that is solely focused on crystal meth, I believe a treatment environment that is solely focused on crystal meth? Uh, In terms of residential treatment centers, I think we have to move out of this thinking that there's a treatment center or that focus on what is on one or the other and think about a more holistic approach to addressing crystal meth. And so treatment centers are adapting the way they deliver treatment to attend to specific needs around crystal meth. But again, it's someplace along the journey. It isn't the first intervention. In community support, there's lots of options. The elders and cultural practitioners talked about the way that they're providing support around addressing crystal meth and healing and ceremony in community. Yeah, I was essentially the same. I'm not aware of any specific treatment centers that are focusing on this alone. And I also just want to echo that there are problems to making it about the specific drug as opposed to the context that problematic drug use is occurring in from the individual to the social level. That being said, one of the things that's happening in Winnipeg is they are changing and adapting some spaces so that people who present to the emergency room, who have been using crystal meth, have somewhere to go that's more tailored to the impacts of crystal meth on them as opposed to the impacts of alcohol. So there's some spaces like that that are being adjusted, but not kind of a treatment-focused space that I'm aware of. So one attendee has asked, Dr. Hopkins was about to speak regarding the elders' messages at the end of her talk. Could Mm -hmm. she speak about some of these teachings? The messages that they had are key messages, and really, I think they talk about a way of thinking about things. So the first one was our expectations. We have to clarify our expectations towards life, to live life, and to work for life. If we approach substance use issues from a foundation of fear, being overwhelmed, I mean, we are overwhelmed with it, but we have to find ways to manage that so that we can move forward with this expectation that we have strengths to offer and that we can ensure life and that the environment is a way to do that. Another one they said very clearly is that helpers, whoever they are, whether they're a counselor or a nurse or a health director or addictions counselor, that we have to help people in the helping professions from whatever discipline and training them to develop belief. And so that goes back to what the Honoring Our Strengths Renewal Framework says, spirit-centered. Belief is attached to understanding spirituality. And so belief is about repattering our thinking so that we do not discount and separate and segregate the impact of culture and spirituality. So invest in developing belief. The second they said is we have to understand our language is medicine. Our language is medicine because it's a spiritual gift given by the creator. Just like everyone in creation was given a language the bears, the birds, all of the animals, the wind, you know, aspects of the earth. They, everybody has a language as people have a language. So it's a sacred gift because it's spiritual in nature given by the creator. Our languages are a medicine. And like in the example I gave of the grandmother who was with an individual, a high on crystal mass, had a knife in his hand threatening her safety. She used the language to pierce through In her mind, it was his spirit that was able to help him respond and keep her safe. So understanding language is a medicine. 
The circle is healing. It's not an any one individual. We all have to work together. All of life moves in a circle. So including family and community, working with partners, whoever they might be. And Marsha, example, she demonstrated there are a lot of partners in conversations supporting youth, championing youth voice, supporting youth voice in the answers and solutions. So circle, connectedness, working together. Again, this is something that Marsha mentioned and I also talked about. We have been trained to think about addressing addiction through criminalization, all of society. But when we approach it from punishment and crime, we don't change the situation. And so especially in the cultural practices, when people were talking about working as a cultural practitioner, they talk about setting up the environment. And so one of the very simple things, which is very profound, is that when they're working in ceremony with people who use crystal masks, there's no angry words. The tone of voice is important. It's not speaking negatively about crystal meth. It's not speaking negatively about the person who is using crystal meth. And so all of that, this way of thinking is not to declare a war on drugs because then your whole focus and your language invests and furthers, entrenches that kind of perspective of punishment and, and criminalizing people. Instead, we have to use what we know, and I have the image of a pipe, which is prayer. It's belief in people that they have a spirit, that we can repair it. We have to invest in understanding that everyone, as I said earlier, Marsha said, everyone has a right to health and we have a responsibility to facilitate that as helpers. So supporting the voice of people who use drugs through our beliefs, our attitudes, our actions in order to get the results that they define that they want for themselves. And the last one was that, you know, our stories of creation gives us the mandate that we all have to be thinking about how do we create that space that facilitates help, belonging, meaning, and purpose. Everybody has to be a support and a help in that regard. And that's it. Okay, I will have to close up now. I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar and again to Marsha and to Carol for lending us their time and their stories and their presentations. And thank you all very much for attending and have a really good day.